2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's talk about the glory of the new covenant. 2 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 7. Paul says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which endures? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold in the world. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance faded away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. From glory to glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be a little theological this morning, so you're going to have to stay with me. Let's pray uh, that the Holy Spirit's going to help us just to receive good words from him today. Father, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your powerful word. I pray that you'd open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts. Give us the ability to receive your eternal truth. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen, amen. and amen. You know, none of us likes to be told what to do. It's summer vacation season. Most of us have plans for a little travel or a little rest after next weekend. My family's going to go away for a week. And thinking about vacation reminds me of something that happened a few years ago while we were vacationing in South Carolina. Our kids came running up the beach and they were all excited because they found some sand dollars in the surf. In all the years that we had been taking vacations at the beach, we had never before found sand dollars. And so they put them in a little a beach bucket with some sand in the bottom and some salt water. And they said, Dad, can we take them home? And I said, sure, we can take them home. Now, it just so happens that whenever we hit the beach, we always camp out near the lifeguard. Just in case anything should happen in the water, I like to be just right front and center, right in front of the lifeguard to make sure that they see us. And it just so happens that the lifeguard overheard our little conversation about the sand dollars. And she came marching over rather forcefully, and she said, Sir, it is illegal to remove sand dollars from the beach. You cannot take those home with you. If you remove them from the beach, you'll be subject to a $1,000 fine. <laughs> I have to confess to you, I was completely taken aback. I had no idea that it was illegal to take a sand dollar from the beach. And I said to her, really? I said, You're, you have to be kidding me. And my kids' faces were just crestfallen. And then my inner New Yorker started to come out. <laughs> I said, look. I said, people all over the beach are collecting sand dollars, and they were. And she said to me, sir, you cannot take those sand dollars off this beach or you will be fined. And she marched back to her chair. Well, for the next couple of hours, while everyone else was enjoying themselves, I sat there stewing in my own juices. <laughs> Denise and my mother-in-law were sun tanning. My father-in-law was lost in a book. The kids were playing in the surf, and I sat there fuming. Who does she think she is? She's just a teenager. I'm a grown man. How dare she speak to me like that? Why is she ruining my kid's innocent fun? Why is she depriving us from taking home a little momentum of our family vacation? Why is she picking on my kids? Throughout the afternoon, she and I uh, exchanged glares a few times. 
And finally, I could see that her shift was coming to an end, and I thought, aha, I'm going to outlast her. <laughs> but before she vacated her post, I could see her pointing to the next lifeguard, our little bucket of sand dollars. <laughs> and before she left the beach, she marched over and she said, sir, please remember that you cannot take those sand dollars from the beach. Now I was beside myself. <laughs> but since my kids were watching the whole thing, I just quietly nodded. Finally, the time came to leave the beach, and I waited until every last item was packed onto the beach cart, and at the very, very last, I took the bucket down, and I put the sand dollars back into the sea. I complied, but with defiance in my heart to the bitter end. And that night, just to show her, I took my kids to the seashell shop, and we bought some sand dollars, which are in a drawer still wrapped in the paper in which we bought them that night. They've never been opened. You know, such is the nature of the human heart. We really don't like being told what to do. We don't like being questioned. We don't like being challenged. We don't like being restricted. The human heart is proud. The human heart is self-centered. The human heart is stubborn. It is recklessly independent. It is defiant. And worst of all, the human heart is self-deceived about its own condition. And such is the nature of the human heart under religion. You know, outwardly, we might comply out of fear of punishment or out of the need to keep up appearances, but inwardly, we are defiant to the bitter end. We reason away our responsibility to obey. We compare ourselves with everyone else. Well, everybody else is picking up sand dollars, so I should be able to. And if we can get away with not complying, if we can find a way to sneak past the lifeguard, we will. Such was the nature of the human heart under the old covenant before Christ came. Sometimes outwardly compliant, but always inwardly defiant. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul compares the old covenant. Some people call it the Mosaic covenant or the Sinaitic covenant. Paul compares it with the new covenant. What is this new covenant? Looking at Paul's words, I find five truths. I want to share them with you quickly this morning. I'm going to go into a little theology, so I need you to stay with me because, you know, he who endures to the end will always speak in tongues, all right? So <laughs> you stay with me and you'll get blessed. What is the new covenant? Five truths. First of all, the new covenant was planned and promised by the Father. We want to talk about the new covenant, but we have to understand a few things about the old covenant. The old covenant was given through Moses at Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone. And looking at Paul's words, I find, first of all, that the Old Covenant had some serious limitations. One limitation was the medium on which the covenant was given. It was given on tablets of stone. That meant that the covenant was external to the human heart. It was a set of rules and regulations imposed on the heart from without. The Old Covenant tells us how God expects us to live, but it provides no internal motivation to comply. A second limitation of the Old Covenant was the audience to which it was given. People with stony hearts. Listen to this. The Old Covenant was not a broken covenant, but it was a covenant that was broken from the very beginning. In other words, there was nothing wrong with the law that God gave. There was nothing deficient about the law. In fact, in the book of Romans, Paul says that the law was holy and righteous and good, revealing God's will to us. I used to read the Old Testament scriptures about delighting in the law and finding the law beautiful. And I wondered how anyone could ever feel that way about a list of rules. It wasn't until I studied the life of Jesus that I realized what the law is. The law is a revelation of the beautiful character of God. What God has commanded us to be in the law is how he is himself. He is truthful. 
He is loyal. He is faithful. He is fair. He is considerate of others. He's generous. He's compassionate. He's merciful. How God commanded us to treat others is how he himself treats us. At Mount Sinai, God didn't hand Israel a broken covenant, but the covenant he handed Israel was broken by them on the very first day. While the stone tablets were still smoking from the finger of God writing on them, the children of Israel were down at the bottom of the mountain worshiping a golden calf. On the same day the covenant was given, it was broken, and that was symbolized by the broken tablets that Moses smashed. And the hard-heartedness displayed by the people on that day never left them. Moses gave the covenant to people who were incapable of keeping it. A third limitation of the old covenant was the temporary grounds on which sins were forgiven. You see, forgiveness has never been through keeping the law. Forgiveness has always been through the blood of sacrifices. But the blood of animals was only sufficient to temporarily cover sins. It wasn't potent enough to secure a permanent remedy for sin. Not only was the old covenant limited, but Paul says that the old covenant had a negative role that was designed to push us toward God. In the mind and the heart of God, the old covenant had a temporary role to play in the plan of salvation. This temporary nature was symbolized by the radiance that faded off of the face of Moses. Moses put a veil over his face and that prevented the people from realizing that it was just a covenant of fading glory. And to this day, they still don't realize that it was a fading covenant that has been surpassed by something new and something better. The veil that was on Moses' face, Paul says, has now been moved to people's hearts and they can't see that something better has come. But the temporary role of the law was to irrefutably prove to every one of us that we are hopeless sinners in dire need of a Savior. The negative purpose of the law was to prove that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The negative purpose of the law was to prove that there is none righteous. No, not one. In Romans 7 and in Galatians 2, Paul says that the beautiful law exposed just how ugly is our sin and just how corrupt is our heart and just how hopeless is our state. And this negative role of the law was designed by God to have the positive result of pushing us towards him, realizing that we can't do it on our own, bringing us to a place of humility before him. Just when Israel reached the pinnacle of breaking the covenant, God made the promise of a new covenant. Speaking through the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Hosea, God promised that a new and a better day was coming. In Jeremiah 31, God said, This is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with your forefathers when I led them out of Egypt. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor nor a man his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So the father planned and promised a new covenant that would overcome the limitations of the old covenant. What is the new covenant? Five truths. The second truth is this. The new covenant was inaugurated by the life and the death of the Son. The new covenant that God promised was inaugurated some 600 years later by Jesus. Jesus said, don't think that I have come to abolish the law, but I have come to fulfill the law. In his beautiful life, Jesus fulfilled the entire old covenant. The sinless life of Jesus was the embodiment of all the righteousness described in the pages of the Old Testament. The beautiful, holy character of God that was revealed in the demands of the law was now on full display in the person of Jesus. 
Do you know Jesus is the only man who ever kept the law entirely? And Jesus didn't only keep the letter of the law, but Jesus' righteous life embodied the spirit of the law. In this way, Jesus completed the law. He manifested what was left unwritten, but was always intended by God. That's one reason why this covenant is better, because it is a complete revelation of God's true nature and character. In his substitutionary death, Jesus fulfilled the law's demand for a sacrifice, and he fulfilled that demand ultimately. On the night he was handed over, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This blood of the covenant, it's poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was recalling the words of Moses that were spoken when the old covenant was inaugurated. Moses took a big basin full of blood and he said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. And then Moses poured half of the blood on the altar and he threw the other half of the blood on the people. There are three symbols that are significant in this. First of all, this blood drenching. It shows that sin is serious, that the only payment for sin is death. Second, that blood poured on the altar showed that the sacrifice, it was directed to God. It was to satisfy God's demands. And third, the blood that was thrown on the people showed that the sacrifice had to be applied to the people. And so it is with the precious blood of the new covenant that was poured out on the cross of Christ. The bloody cross shows us that sin is a deadly, serious problem and that the only payment for sin is death. The blood of Jesus was an atoning sacrifice that was directed to God to satisfy his demands. But the blood of Jesus must be applied to each one of us personally. And fulfilling the old covenant with his life and his death, Jesus inaugurated the new covenant. You know, that word new is interesting. It has several different shades of meaning. New can mean the latest in a sequence. New also, that word new also means superior. But I especially like this. That word new carries that sense with it of pristine, untouched, unbroken. The, the new car smell, if you will. The old covenant wasn't a broken covenant, but it was a covenant that was broken from the very first. But the new covenant it is not broken. It is pristine. It is unmarred. It is unbroken because the new covenant doesn't depend on us. It depends only on him. What is the new covenant? You doing all right this morning? All right, you're getting a little theology. I paid tens of thousands of dollars for seminary, and you're getting all this for free this morning. What is the new covenant? Five truths. It was planned and promised by the Father. It was inaugurated by the life and death of the Son. And third, listen, the new covenant is written on the human heart by the Spirit. God said, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to supersede the limitations of the old covenant. Instead of temporarily covering sins with the blood of animal sacrifices, I'm going to provide the ultimate remedy for sin through the blood of my Son. Instead of giving this new covenant to stony-hearted people, I'm going to replace their stony heart with a soft heart. And instead of giving my law externally, I'm going to write my law internally on my hearts and I'm going to put my spirit in their hearts so that they will always desire to obey me. The new covenant was planned by the Father. It was inaugurated by the Son, but it is applied to us personally by the Spirit. The Spirit gives us seven new things in the new covenant. I'm going to give them to you fast. Seven new things. First of all, he gives us a new forgiveness. Rather than the temporary forgiveness of the Old Testament sacrifices, in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit administers to us total cleansing from sin. God said, I will sprinkle you with clean water, and so you shall be clean from your impurities. The blood of Jesus doesn't merely cover our sins. It cleanses us from sin deep within our being. 
The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from sin. It cleanses our guilty memories of sin. It removes sin from our nature. Paul used this picture. He said it's like a lump of dough that has had yeast that has been introduced to it. And the yeast has completely infiltrated that lump of dough. Who could go through that dough and remove the yeast from the dough? But this is what the blood of Jesus has done. He has gone through our being and he has separated sin from us. The blood of Jesus removes our sin from God's memory too. Listen to this. God says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. It really is true. Once I've entered into the new covenant, I am justified by the blood of Jesus in the eyes of God. And he looks at me just as if I'd never sinned. The Spirit gives us seven new things in the New Covenant. Second, He gives us a new heart. The Old Covenant wasn't a broken covenant, but it was a covenant that was broken because God's people had stony hearts. So God said, this time I'm going to give them a new soft heart of flesh. Instead of a proud heart, I'm going to give them a humble heart. Instead of a stubborn heart, I'm going to give them a teachable heart. Instead of a defiant heart, I'm going to give them a surrendered heart. And on this new soft heart, I will write my laws and my commands directly by my spirit. Instead of being guided by words from without, they'll be guided by righteous impulses from within. Instead of a list of rules, they're going to have a heart full of right desires. Instead of nitpicking over the letter of the law, they will instinctively embody the spirit of the law. Instead of inquiring after the minimum requirements, what's the least I can do to get by the lifeguard, they'll intuitively want to do the very most to please God. This new heart, it gives us new spiritual life. We go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. It brings us a new kind of righteousness, not a righteousness of our own making, but Christ's own righteousness that has been deposited within us by the Spirit. The Spirit gives us, this is good preaching, by the way. The Spirit gives us seven new things in the new covenant. Third is a new relationship with God. God says in the new covenant, I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be their God means that God gives himself to us unreservedly. Everything that God is, he makes available to us. Everything that God can do, he makes available to us. Everything that God has, he makes available to us. They will be my people means we belong to God as his own family, as his precious possessions. God will bless us with everything he is. He'll help us with everything he can do. He'll care for us with everything he has. This new relationship, it gives us a secure new identity. It gives us significance in life. It gives us confidence. It gives us peace. It gives us joy. Seven new things in the new covenant. Number four is a new knowledge of God. When Israel broke the old covenant, they were left with hardened hearts. Their hardened hearts prevented them from truly knowing how beautiful God is. In his pup tent of prayer, Moses spoke to God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But the children of Israel were afraid of the glory of God that was left over on Moses' face. Their experience with God was not one of friendship. It was an experience of condemnation. And so God says, even to this day, God has not given them a heart to know him. He hasn't given them eyes to see him or ears to hear him. Paul picks up those same words in 2 Corinthians 3. He says, even to this day, a veil remains over their hearts so they cannot know him. But God says in the new covenant, Everyone will know me from the least to the greatest. In the new covenant, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes. He opens our ears. He opens our mind. He opens our heart. He enables us to see the beauty of God. The Spirit gives us seven new things in the new covenant. Number five is a new freedom. You know, this is the weekend that we celebrate freedom as Americans. But I want to tell you the American ideal of freedom and the Christian ideal of freedom are two different things. As Americans, freedom means independence. 
But as Christians, freedom means freedom from independence. As Christians, freedom doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we please. As Christians, freedom means that we are now free to do what pleases God. Freedom is freedom to obey Him, to keep His commandments. Peter wrote, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for sin, but living as servants of God. The Holy Spirit sets us free to worship God, to pray to Him with a clear conscience, and so to experience Him. The Holy Spirit sets us free from the veil of religion that prevents us from truly seeing the beauty of Jesus and the joy of serving Him. The Holy Spirit sets us free from the treadmill of religious self-righteousness, trying to do it in our own strength. The Holy Spirit sets us free from the treadmill of religious pretense, trying to keep up appearances to, for the sake of others. The Holy Spirit sets us free from the boredom and the futility and the cynicism that comes through religion. There was a Jewish teacher named Nicodemus. He had a conversation with Jesus one night, and Jesus told him, Nicodemus, you have to be born again, meaning you have to experience spiritual renewal. Now, Nicodemus did not misunderstand Jesus' words. He understood Jesus perfectly, but after a lifetime of religious pursuit, Nicodemus didn't believe that that kind of transformation was possible. He said, Jesus, born again, spiritual renewal. You might as well tell me, a grown man, that to go back into my mother's womb, what you're saying is not possible. But the Holy Spirit sets us free to hope, to believe, and to experience this transformation. The Spirit gives us seven new things in the new covenant. Here's number six, and this is my favorite, and this is the heart of what I want to share with you today. So I want you to catch this. There are two truths that you need to know about God's glory. The sixth thing he gives us, he gives us a new every morning experience of God's glory. There are two things that you need to know about God's glory. First of all, the glory of God is his presence. His blazing, beautiful, overwhelming, all-consuming presence. And second, the glory of God's presence transforms all those who experience it. Beloved, this is another sermon for another day, but whatever we behold, we become. Whatever we fix our eyes on, whatever we gaze at, whatever we look at, whatever we fasten the eyes of our heart upon, that is what we become. Now follow me this morning. Moses met God in a pup tent of prayer. And afterwards, Moses' face was changed. His face radiated with the glory of God's presence. In that tent, Moses beheld with his eyes the shining presence of God, and his face became like what he was looking at. But his experience was an experience of fading glory. The physical effect was only temporary. In the new covenant, our experience with the glory of God is not outward on our faces, but it is inward in our heart. And our experience is not an experience of fading glory, but our experience is one of ever-increasing glory from glory to glory. Listen, the surpassing glory of the new covenant is the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of our hearts and transforming us. God said, I will put my spirit in you and he will move you to instinctively and intuitively follow my commands. Paul says that the Holy Spirit is like a mirror in our heart directly reflecting Jesus to us. You see, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they look exactly like one another. He says, the Lord is the Spirit. He calls the Spirit here, the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus and the Holy Spirit look exactly like one another. And the Holy Spirit is a mirror that God puts in my heart who reflects Jesus directly into my heart. 
There are no filters. There are no veils. There are no covers. The Holy Spirit in my heart continuously reveals Jesus to me, and he progressively reveals Jesus to me. He keeps showing me Jesus, and he keeps showing me more and more Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit does this, he creates a wow factor in my heart towards God. This is good preaching right here. As the Holy Spirit reflects Christ to my heart, he creates a thrill and an awe and a wonder and a reverence. He creates a lovely, loving desire for God, a hungry longing after his beautiful presence. You know what I know about Moses? I know that Moses couldn't wait to get back into that pup tent, to take off the veil and to behold the beauty of the Lord one more time. And the Holy Spirit in my heart reflecting Jesus creates the same effect. He creates a delight and a pleasure and a joy and a quiver, and a tremble, and a holy anticipation of God's presence. Listen, what Moses felt staring at the burning bush is what we feel inside our heart because the Holy Spirit is there. What Moses felt on top of Mount Sinai is what we feel in our heart because the Holy Spirit is there reflecting Jesus. What Moses felt in the tent of meeting, in the pup tent of prayer, is what we feel. What Moses felt hiding in the cleft of the rock while the glory of God passed by him, that is what we feel because there's a mirror in our heart heart reflecting Christ to us. And listen, it is this continual wow factor that incrementally transforms our character and makes us into the shape of Christ. Just as the glory of God temporarily changed Moses' face, so in the new covenant, the glory of God's presence in my heart, it keeps incrementally and permanently changing my heart. You know, that was the experience that God originally wanted for Israel. God wanted all of them to experience his glory so that the wow factor would keep their hearts from wandering away from him. When God descended on Mount Sinai with smoke and with fire and with quaking earth and with the sound of a trumpet, God wanted them all to come near. Moses said to them, don't be afraid, come near. God has come to prove you so that the fear of the Lord will purify your heart and keep you from wandering away from him. But Israel refused the experience. They pulled back. They pulled away from God's presence. And so Israel spent her entire history separated from the glory of God. She was separated at Mount Sinai. She was separated from God's glory by Moses' tent and by Moses' veil. She was separated from God's glory by the curtain in the tabernacle that sectioned off the Holy of Holies. He, they were separated from God's presence by the curtain in the temple behind which the Ark of the Covenant sat, separated from the glory of God. They never experienced the wow factor and therefore they were never changed. But in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is the glory of God's presence inside of us, revealing Christ to us, creating a wow factor that changes us into the image of Christ from glory to glory. There is coming a day when that process will be complete. It's the moment that we finally see him face to face. John says in that moment we will undergo the completion of this transformation. He writes, creation has never yet seen the likes of what we are about to become. But when he comes, we shall become like him for we shall see him as he is. The Spirit gives us seven new things in the new covenant. A new forgiveness, a new heart, a new relationship with God, a new knowledge of God, a new freedom, a new every morning experience of His glory, and finally, 
a new hopeful boldness. We ended on this last week. We'll end on it again this week. The new covenant, it is permanent and it is irrevocable. It will never be superseded. It will never be surpassed in splendor. It is an eternal covenant. And the new covenant will never ever lose a single ounce of its power to change men's hearts and to transform their inner nature. God said, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. I like that. And I will inspire them to fear me so they will never turn away from me. Therefore, we are very bold in the world. Even as American society defies God, and rejects his righteousness, we go right on speaking confidently. We go right on speaking boldly because we know that God will sustain us and we know that God will continue to work through us. What is the new covenant? Five truths. I'm going to give you the last two in two minutes and then we're going to share communion together. The new covenant was planned and promised by the Father. The new covenant was inaugurated by the life and death of the Son. The new covenant is written on the human heart by the Spirit. Number four, very quickly. The new covenant is administered by the apostolic ministry of the church. How do people find this new covenant? How do they discover this new covenant? How do they find their way into, into the new covenant? Well, it is introduced to them through us, through his church. We bear witness to the new covenant by living it in front of the eyes of men. We bear witness to the new covenant through our changed lives, through our devotion to Christ, through our love for one another, through our worship. We bear witness to the new covenant by sharing together at the Lord's table that we're about to do. Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you bear witness to the new covenant in Jesus' blood. We testify about the new covenant through our preaching, through our sharing Christ with friends. We demonstrate the surpassing glory of this covenant through our ministry of supernatural signs and wonders and healings and miracles. Had a woman who received a wonderful healing from the Lord after our 10 o'clock uh, service last week. She it was in pain for uh, weeks and weeks and the prayer team prayed for her and she said, I have not been in pain a day since. Praise God. God has made each one of us, listen, every one of us, competent ministers of this new covenant. If you are in the new covenant, then you are a competent minister of the new covenant. And God is going to use you to administer it to others. What is the new covenant? Five truths. Here's the last one. And we're done. Worship team, you can help me. The new covenant must be received one by one on God's terms. Everyone listen to this. The new covenant must be received one by one on God's terms. One last thing I need to share with you about the new covenant. In the Bible, there are different types of covenant. There are covenants between men and men, covenants between nations. But the kind of covenant that God makes with men is a unilateral covenant. In this kind of covenant, the party that initiates the covenant holds all the cards. The party that initiates the covenant is far superior to the party to whom the covenant is directed. The superior party sets all the terms and the inferior party has only to decide whether to accept or to reject it. That truth is especially conveyed by the unique Greek word that is used for covenant, new covenant. It means God is the superior party. It means he holds all the cards. It means God has set all the terms. We bring absolutely nothing to the bargaining table. We have no power to negotiate terms. It is only ours to accept or to reject his covenant. How many times when you're talking about spiritual things with people, do you hear them say, I worship God my own way? Psh, as if God has given any of us that prerogative. 
Have you ever considered what a stunningly arrogant statement that is? Who do you think you are that God has given you the right to worship him your own way? There is only one way to approach God in worship, and that is on the terms that he has said in the new covenant. Paul says we must each enter this new covenant one by one. He said, whenever one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away from his heart and he enters into the beautiful freedom of the new covenant. The blood of Jesus poured out on the cross, the blood of the new covenant. It was a sacrifice that was directed to God, but that blood must be applied to each one of us personally. And so here's my simple question for you this morning. Have you experienced the surpassing glory of the new covenant? Have you experienced this new forgiveness, this new heart, this new relationship, this new knowledge of God, this new freedom, this new every morning experience of his glory, this new hopeful boldness? Have you turned to the Lord and said yes to him on his terms? I'll leave you with this true story. The first ever heart transplant was performed in Johannesburg, South Africa, by a man called Dr. Christian Barnard. Interestingly, the transplant patient was a fellow doctor named Philip Bleiberg. After the surgery, first time it had ever been done, Dr. Barnard said to Dr. Bleiberg, would you like to see your old heart? He reached into a cabinet and he took out a glass jar and he handed it to Dr. Bleiberg and inside was his old heart. Dr. Bleiberg sat there stunned for a moment. He was the first man in history to ever hold his own heart in his hands. For the next 10 minutes or so, he asked Dr. Barnard a bunch of technical medical questions. And then he took a final look at his old heart in the jar and he said, so this is my old heart that caused me so much trouble. Goodbye then. And he handed it back to Dr. Barnard and he said, please take it away. I never want to see it again. Have you said goodbye to your old heart that has caused you so much trouble? Would you like to? You can simply by saying yes to the new covenant. Would you stand on your feet this morning? Would you give Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, a great big praise in this place? Come on, let's move.